Hey everyone, Happy New Year, and we want to say Happy New Year and welcome to the very first Radiotopia Presents of 2024. It's a series that we are truly excited about. It's called Shocking, Heartbreaking, Transformative. Now this is from documentarian Jess Shane, who put out an open call on Craigslist and then worked with four strangers to explore the standard rules that documentarians and journalists use to tell their subject stories. So the series gets into all sorts of questions about what happens when people's real lives are collected, edited, and consumed. The show pulls back the curtain on what goes on behind the scenes of your favorite nonfiction shows. And then it turns in on itself and some really interesting twists and turns along the way in the making of the show. I've gotten to know Jess a little bit over the making of this show. Every time I chat with her, there's a new wrinkle to this story. It is really incredible. So go check out the new Radiotopia Presents series, Shocking, Heartbreaking, Transformative. It is out now on your favorite podcast platform. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, July 8th, 1947, actually it's July 7th, 1947 is our date. And I think that for a lot of listeners, that date may not mean much, but I suspect there are some out there who know exactly what happened on July 7th, 1947, or maybe a little obsessed with what happened on July 7th, 1947, because that was the date that a rancher named W.W. Mac Brazel and his son Vernon, (laughs) great names, great 1940s names, Mac and Vernon were driving across their ranch land some 80 miles north of Roswell, New Mexico, when they encountered something they'd never seen before. It was, in Mac's words, a large area of bright wreckage made up of rubber strips, tinfoil, and rather tough paper and sticks. He didn't really know what to do. He didn't know what it was, so he basically took it up the chain of command. He talked to the local mayor, who eventually ended up talking to the Air Force, who then took possession of the wreckage. In the next day's paper, there was this headline, Roswell Army Airfield captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell. And from then, well, Roswell entered the public imagination, flying saucer fever, rumors of captured aliens, Area 51, black sites, on and on and on and on. And here we are today doing this episode about the wreckage found in the New Mexico desert in 1947. With us, as always, is Nicole Hammer of Columbia and Kelly Carter Jackson of Wesley. Hello there. The truth is out there, Jody. (laughs) Oh, there you go. There it is. Also, hello. Hey there. should I just ask if you be- should I just ask if you believe in aliens right off the bat? No, we're gonna we're gonna build to that. Um, let's stay in 1947 and let me just reread something that I don't think I'd ever gotten my head around. Even though I knew the importance of Roswell, I knew that it was where a lot of this idea of a flying saucer can run. Again, I will quote Max's words: "A large area of bright wreckage made up of rubber strips, tin foil, rather tough paper, and sticks." To me, classic UFO ingredients. That doesn't strike. <laughs> classic, <laughs> high, super smart interstellar technology. Rubber, paper, <laughs> sticks, and tin foil. Um, this was a weather balloon, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, I mean it's not exciting at all to think of that, but weather balloon makes so much sense. It makes even more sense than a UFO if you think about it. But uh, yeah, it's it's kind of a this dramatic story that leads to a, a little bit of a major letdown in that when you think about how the War Department, you know, publishes the statement they collected all of the debris and they're like, no, 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 sorry guys, this is just a weather balloon. Um, and then they also put out their own headline that says, Army debunks Roswell flying this as world simmers with excitement. Sorry. Well, and there. yet yeah. the world still simmered with excitement. Right? Yeah. I mean, this genuinely set off flying saucer fever um, in part just because they maybe, I mean, I don't know what was it that they botched that initial framing. And then from there, it just mm. took off. I would think that in addition to that, that weather balloon landed on some fertile ground for exactly this kind of conspiracy. Mm. I mean, we're talking about a moment the uh, nuclear bombs had just been um, announced to the world Mm -hmm. quite dramatically. Um, Two years earlier, there was the conspiratorial mindedness of the early Cold War. Um, Sci-fi had become an increasingly popular art form. So by the time this weather balloon lands, 
you have a population that is ready to believe um, that it is something much more. So mm-hmm. that the idea got floated out there, I think it caught on to something pretty fertile. Hmm. Yeah, I do think that, you know, we've talked about this before. People mm-hmm. love a good conspiracy theory. People love, you know, history that is hidden or being shielded from the public. And so I think that this was prime for that in which people could take a lot of this and run with it. And and it's, you know, I mean, because of this, it's really become like a major tourist destination or a bucket list uh, that someone wants to go and, to this area and find for themselves some sort of evidence that will point to, you know, this conspiracy theory or support or back up the idea that there were UFOs. Mm-hmm. And in 1947, the government was hiding a lot of stuff. (laughs) And they had been testing weapons out in the desert, right? You're talking about the far west where the federal Mm -hmm. government has all sorts of secret installations and is doing all kinds of things. So it's, it's no wonder that people very easily believed that something was going on that was a little more nefarious. Right. And it's worth saying that this area, there is an Air Force base there, and it was and I think is, by all accounts, a place where new technology is being tested. And so this weather balloon, um, you know, again, I don't think uh, Mac and Vernon identified sort of cutting edge technology, but it was... uh, I'm trying not to use the word alien, but it was alien looking, right? It was new. It was alien in the in the classic foreign, sense, foreign, foreign um, and, and that it was new. And so, again, all all the sticky and good conspiracy theories are grounded in this element of truth. It does play into this notion that there was testing of new technology happening. Mm-hmm. And that, as you've been describing, the government was up to um, some stuff that we didn't know about and was being very secretive about. Um, that said, we should maybe talk about the, what the sort of classic... Area 51 Roswell incident conspiracy theory is, which is actually that this was in fact a UFO, but not just that, there were actually aliens on board this UFO that were then taken back to the base and tests were conducted, yada, yada, yada. And, you know, we're a politics show, uh, and so I suppose we should talk about the political (laughs) dimension here, which is like, basically every president since has kind of had to just like... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> debunk or confront or like you know just sort of deal with like are there aliens at Roswell it's it's remarkable I think it's hilarious that like in 1954 there's this big thing that Eisenhower met with aliens on February 20th of 1954 and historians are like nope he went yeah. to the dentist that's what they say <laughs> but I think that's exactly that's exactly right that that it is one of the most persistent conspiracy theories in an era of a large number of conspiracy theories. And it is not for nothing that when Donald Trump was elected president, people were like, oh, my God, he's going to have access to all of these state secrets. And one of the things people were kind of like, well, he might actually just tell us about these UFOs because he's not going to keep classified information classified. Like there's still this kind of this sense that there is still hidden information about this, that the government is uh unwilling to relinquish this makes me think of something so there's this thing called the fermi paradox which is basically like it ends with basically aliens don't really exist because they haven't come and visited us yet right to me i think the new paradox is we know aliens don't exist because donald trump didn't tweet about it exactly if if, if, if someone because we know if someone had told that guy about it he would not be able to resist tweeting about it like some the jig is up guys the jig is up so there we go I think I mean we can't we can't get away from this. I think not because only it's political, but it's also so popular that there's a TV show called Roswell. Yeah. Like I don't know if it's still airing. I think it was on the CW or something like that, but you know, it it lets I mean it's it's a really well done show, but it's a way for people to tap into at least dramatically these ideas about UFOs and aliens and um, and it's a drama that plays out really well on TV. So I think it you know, there's a lot there to keep this these fires going. And I think that's important because there is a way to look at Roswell as a Cold War phenomenon, right? The conspiracies around the Cold War, the U.S. government is doing a lot of secret experimentation. It's three months later when Sputnik is launched. So we know that the Soviet Union is doing a lot of experimentation. Um, There are conversations between Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev where Reagan is like, if the aliens invade, 
we're going to unite together um, despite our differences. <laughs> we're friends, right? <laughs> um, so you could imagine that the story kind of ends as the, the paranoia and the angst um, of the Cold War ends, but it had been around for so long at that point. It had been so embedded in popular culture and science fiction that it very much had a life of its own um, even after the end of the Cold War. And people look for sightings. You know, there are people who are constantly reporting UFOs or some sort of um, foreign objects that are flying in their neighborhood or what they saw on their farm or what they saw on the rooftop or whatever. Um, so there's there's a constant feed of people spotting things every now and then. Yeah, for sure. And there is, uh, this isn't the biggest element here, but there is also, you know, a cottage industry around this, certainly in Roswell. I mean, people go and visit it. There's museums. You know, I think that there's a slight economic incentive to keep at least the Roswell stuff going. Um, I will mention that my wife has run a marathon at Area 51 that happens in the middle of the night and everyone is wearing like alien costumes and you run this marathon along this lonely highway uh, in the middle of the desert. It's apparently quite quite fun, but, you know, there you go. Uh, there's, you know, th- there's that. Um, there are, of course these larger questions about uh, alien life and we're, one of the reasons we wanted to do this episode was because, you know, in recent weeks and months there have been, um, you know, some, I don't even know how to characterize them, I guess revelations, but effectively, you know, the, the government and the Air Force coming clean and saying there are some incidents that we cannot explain. Now they, I think, draw that sort of line and saying this is not proof of something, this is just a lack of counterproof of something or however you want to frame it. Um, but, you know, this is back in the news and this is back and I'm curious just sort of how you've been reacting to it and where your head's at. You know, to be fair, I'm not, um, I can be convinced. I mean, I, I think about, I watch a lot of like the Rover as mm-hmm. on Mars and just like waiting for something to pop up. <laughs> like, I know I can't be the only one that's like, something's around the corner, just wait. Like, but I I think that the galaxy, the world that we live in is so massive and so big. I would not be surprised. Now, does it look like E.T.? Probably not. But is there something out there? Sure. Why not? I mean, the world is big and our the sun is so small. Our planet is so small. Um I can't possibly imagine something not being out there. I am 100% with Kelly on this. I mean, I don't, I think those videos that came out, (laughs) there has been some pretty good explanation for what we're actually seeing and it is not, you know, alien life. Um, But sure, the universe is vast and we are but a tiny part of it. So yes, I am Mm -hmm. on board for the aliens. Not so sure that they have visited, but open to it. I appreciate the your the spirit in which the two of you are talking about this, which is like occasionally, especially in this last few weeks, you know, I've been talking with friends or whatever, and or been listening to podcasts or you know, and people, uh, there's such a gravity around this question, like you know, are we alone? And I understand the the sort of how deep that question is, but I have the same sort of, I'm just like, well, you know. I don't really have a strong opinion. I don't really care one way or another. I'm like a little agnostic. I'm interested, but I'm not like, I don't feel like it's at the top of my list to figure out or have a stance on, you know? It's like, sure. And, you know, the one thing I will point out, I think, Nikki, you you hinted at this, but the Air Force and the government are now using this phrase UAP, which is not unidentified flying object, UFO. It is unidentified aerial phenomenon, which I think is uh, important parsing because it leaves open the possibility for like glare on a camera or like a bug a bug on the on the camera or like you know and i think i've seen a fair amount of um debunking uh of some of these mysterious photos and videos that is just like yeah this was like camera glare or like someone was smudging the camera or 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 whatever so uap important to sort of put that distinction out there i love that because you're assuming flying and you're assuming object in UFO. So I am all aboard for mm-hmm. UAP. Let's make it happen. Sounds great. Yeah, yeah. Eventually they'll downgrade even further and I'll just be like three question marks in a row and that'll just be like how they, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, All right. Well, that feels like a good place to end it. Um, Nicole Hammer, thanks to you as always. Thank you, Jody. And Kelly Carter-Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure. 
This Day in Esoteric Political History is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX, a network of independent, listener-supported, artist-owned podcasts. Our researcher and producer is Jacob Feldman. Our producer is Brittany Brown. You can get in touch with us with any questions or comments or ideas for the show. Email us thisdaypod at gmail.com, or you can find a form at thisdaypod.com. My name is Jody Avergan. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you soon. Radiotopia.